There's alanine, arginine, cysteine, and glutamine, tryptophan, proline, serine, asparagine, glycine, and glutamic acid, and threonine, and tyrosine. There's leucine, and lysine, and isoleucine, phenylalanine, and histidine. Then there's valine, and aspartic acid, and last but not least, gadomethionine. Remember the city, and you will see what it's the biochemages bambinos. For now, you remember the names of the 20 most commonplace acid aminos. You know what this means, don't you? They've solved chemistry. Hey, guess what? You, yes you, are already a master of nitrogen chemistry. Your body makes billions of nitrogen compounds every second of every day, and basically every chemical reaction keeping you alive relies on nitrogen chemistry in some form or another. Everything, from the food you eat to the air you breathe, is chock full of nitrogen compounds. Unless you eat nothing but rocks and happen to live in the vacuum of space, in which case I assume you have bigger problems to attend to. Nitrogen can be found in all living creatures, predominantly as a component in amino acids, simple organic compounds that act as the chemical building blocks for proteins. Structure-wise, an amino acid is just a carbon atom bonded to four different chemical substituents, a a hydrogen atom, an amine group, a nitrogen bonded to two hydrogens, and a carboxylic acid group, a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and an OH group. The fourth substituent is a sort of spooky mystery group, usually designated R. This R group can be any number of things, and it's the main part of an amino acid that dictates its chemistry. Now there are, to use a technical term, a stumongous number of amino acids, and biochemists have discovered over 500 different R groups in nature. But the term amino acid is largely used to talk about the 20 compounds found in DNA, also known as the standard amino acids. Basically every protein in your body is comprised of some combination of the these compounds linked together in long molecular chains known as peptides. But how do we remember the names of all these compounds? Well, I think I feel a song coming on. There's alanine. Uh, oh, we did the song already. Why are you not getting two musical numbers out of me? Sorry, union rules. When writing papers, biochemists will often abbreviate the names of the standard amino acids to save space. Sometimes with three letters, sometimes with one. Not to fear, though, the three letter abbreviations are fairly straightforward, and I'm sure the same applies to the one letter ones. Alanine is A, cysteine is C, phenylalanine is F. Okay, phenyl, kind of see what you're going for there. Tryptophan is. W. Glutamine is Q. Serious question, biochemists. What is this? This is the kind of stuff that encourages medicine students to bully us behind our backs. You know, when they're not snorting coke or having mental breakdowns over their flashcard decks. Pure nitrogen is found in nature as dinitrogen, more commonly known as nitrogen gas, or N2. By mass, nitrogen gas is the most abundant compound in air, and it's renowned for both its stability and unreactivity. The nitrogen atoms in N2 are kept glued together with a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond, which is one of the strongest types of covalent bond known to man. Making and breaking chemical bonds is what makes a reaction a reaction, and even if you subject nitrogen gas to crazy high temperatures, that triple bond has about as much chance of breaking as a suit of armour does against a dueling saber made out of crusty breadsticks. When looking for information on whether a compound is safe to use or not, chemists will often have a look at that compound's fire diamond, a shorthand safety code issued to various materials by the National Fire Protection Agency. The blue, red and yellow squares of a fire diamond are assigned a number from 0 to 4 depending on the material's physical properties. There's blue for health risk, red for flammability, and yellow for stability and chemical reactivity. The white square, meanwhile, contains codes and symbols for more specific acids. This symbol means this compound reacts vigorously with water water, and this one means don't put this compound near your nads unless you want your future children to be born with gills. As of 2021, the numbers on a fire diamond from nitrogen gas are 0, 0 and uh, 0. It ain't poisonous, it ain't reactive, and it literally has the flammability rating reserved for water and concrete. In fact, the only real hazard posed by nitrogen gas is the SA in the white square, which stands for simple asphyxiant. But unless you literally entomb yourself in a room full of nitrogen gas, or get bonked on the head by a canister of it, it's not particularly likely to feature in the details of your obituary. The discovery of nitrogen gas is attributed to the Scottish scientist Daniel Rutherford. As part of his dissertation at the University of Edinburgh, Rutherford was investigating the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere. He noticed that the air took on unusual properties when carbon dioxide and oxygen were removed from it, substances that were known Known back then as fixed air and deflogisticated air respectively. When CO2 and oxygen were removed from air, the gas that remained must have seemed cartoonishly evil. Lighting a candle in it was impossible, and living things began to suffocate if left in it for too long. In recognition of the gas's life-draining properties, Rutherford christened the new compound noxious air. Bit ironic in hindsight, not like life as we know it will be literally impossible without nitrogen chemistry or anything. Now, nitrogen itself is about as likely to combust as a Veruca plaster on the floor of a swimming pool, but the same can't be said of its compounds. Remember what I said about exothermic reactions in the hydrogen video? The more stable the product of reaction are, the more vigorously the reagents will react with each other to make it. If a compound can make nitrogen gas through a chemical reaction, it will do so with little provocation, sometimes releasing enormous amounts of energy in the form of an explosion. One compound that demonstrates this principle beautifully is 246-trinitrotoluene, more commonly known as TNT. Pure TNT is a yellow crystalline solid, and to the untrained eye, you probably wouldn't think it was an explosive at all. It doesn't react with water, it's largely sensitive to shock, and you can even melt it without so much as singeing your eyebrow hairs. In fact, for the first three decades after its discovery, TNT was largely a chemical novelty. 
and it was only really used as a cheap yellow colouring agent in the dyeing industry. Unfortunately, this was a very silly idea for a number of reasons. One, pure TNT is highly poisonous, and on repeated exposure it can lead to liver poisoning and male infertility. And two, if you heat TNT to above 210 degrees Celsius, or slam it with enough force, the ensuing reaction will obliterate everything in its surroundings. Sort of like the chemical equivalent of a bull smashing through a china shop fundraiser for brittle boned orphans. The driving force of TNT explosions is a decomposition reaction. The TNT molecules take in energy from the surroundings to wrench their bonds apart with explosive force, producing nitrogen gas, hydrogen gas, carbon monoxide and elemental carbon, usually in the form of soot. The sheer power of this reaction has made TNT the most common military explosive in the world, and its convenient handling properties like its insensitivity to shock have only hastened its rise to fame. Now, the gigabrained memory wizards among you may recall I said TNT could be melted without exploding. This is because TNT's melting point is way lower than the point at which it'll spontaneously detonate. As a liquid, it can be poured into shell cases, or mixed with other explosives, many of which are also nitrogen compounds. Unfortunately, TNT is the only one of these I'll be covering today, mostly because we're nearing the end of the video already, but I'm already on some sort of watch list for the crack joke and I don't want to push my luck. So next element is oxygen. Should be nice and easy to summarise, not like it's one of the most important elements in chemistry or anything. There's a few topics I deliberately left out of this video, primarily because I want to tackle them in the next episode. Like, who discovered noxious air was an element and not just a compound? What are the other gases in air? And most pressing of all, what in God's name does the word deflogisticated mean? But for now, we can leave it at this. Nitrogen makes boomies, zoomies, bloomies, and b bassoonies. <laughs> Why does that sound like a Zumbini spin-off? <laughs>